All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So hi, for the sake of the recording, hi everyone, I'm Tracy Speckman. I wanna to talk to you about five truths and a lie. My kids loved this title. <laughs> I was telling them about possible titles for, for talking about uh, new babies. Five truths and a lie. But though one of them said, no mom, it's two truths and a lie. I'm like, I got more than just two things to say. So we'll do five truths and a lie. Um, if you wanted to find me more, find more places about me, I have a Facebook group uh, that's called Sleep Sisters Get Quiet Nights. At first, I just called it Sleep Sisters, but some people misconstrued what it was about. So I had to add my Get Quiet Nights in there because there were some inappropriate people trying to get in. I'm like, why are all these men trying to get into my group? I'm like, oh, right, okay, right. Sleep group, and I had to make sure that it was really obvious in the introduction what the group was about. And it's a mom-to-mom -mom support group, and people can tag me and ask questions, and I can direct people to other things that I do like. Like I have a, a YouTube channel. If you go into YouTube and search Tracy Spackman, you probably come up, find my channel. Um, and I have a lot of things like this uh, in there. And uh, this one will be in. The one I did a few months ago for this group is in there. And I just watched it this afternoon. <laughs> like, I'm fun. Well, maybe it's just because I like to watch myself on video. <laughs> and I think that I'm fun. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully you think that I'm fun. Um, and then I have, uh, for Phoenix, I have this group that's called Sleep Deprived Crazy Mamas of Phoenix. So if you're in Phoenix, you can join that group. And I, I usually use that group to talk about um, live classes that I'm given, giving, but I haven't been able to give a live class in like two years. It's just been all about Zoom classes and Skype classes. And I'd like to think that I'm getting better, getting better at it. So five truths and a lie. Oh, and my website, getquietnights.com. There's a, a really great blog um, feature there and a place to look at all the different packages. And, and by age, mom's talking about their experience with sleep coaching. And so that's, that's fun, and, fun and interesting. So five truths and a lie. I'm going to add the closed captioning to the bottom and see if that works. Yes, I think it's working. All right. So, um, let me make sure I can still see all of the controls with all the different things that, that I have open. All right. So, truth number one there is a fourth trimester. So, the three trimesters that you're pregnant, and then there's a fourth trimester. Have you ever heard of that? Um, I think there's a whole group called the fourth trimester, but this is something that I didn't know. I asked the women in my sleep sisters get quite nice Facebook group. What are all the things that you wish that someone had told you uh, when you were pregnant about having a baby? And one of the most common answers was this idea that there was a fourth trimester. And so the fourth trimester is the 12 week period immediately after you have a baby. So the first three months. Um, and I certainly hadn't heard of it. Um, and every mother and their newborn baby will go through it. And it's a time of great physical and emotional change as your baby adjusts to being outside the womb and you adjust to your new life as a mom. So it's still like being pregnant because you're usually your baby is still right here. <laughs> you carry your baby all the time. Your baby is with you all the time and you get to know your baby, the whole purpose of the first three months of having a baby. Um, of course, keeping them safe and feeding them and everything, but uh, the goal could be to get to know your baby. What facial expressions, what do they do with their hands? What do their body language look like to tell you when they're tired and when they're hungry? And are they super smiley or not super smiley? You're getting to know their temperament traits. So this quote that I have on here was one of the comments from one of the moms. And she said, I wish someone would have told me that the fourth trimester is a real thing and it will drain you and test you and you will most likely cry. It will have wonderful ups and bad downs. You will be tired and you will question if you are doing a good job. 
and she wanted to stress, you are doing a great job. You will look back on those times with fond memories and it will go quick. Your baby needs you, not a clean house or folded laundry, but a healthy you just to love them. So of all, I have five kids and of all of my kids, the fourth trimester that I remember the most is the first one. <laughs> Probably because I wasn't distracted by other kids. That's the one that I remember the most. And I remember it being really hard and really satisfying at the same time. And wondering how I was going to cook dinner and do the laundry and sweep the floor and take care of the baby. I found it really hard to balance it all. And then as I added more kids and more kids and more kids up to five, I felt like I could never have a clean house. Um, and I had to just let that go. And now they're all teenagers and adults and I can have a clean house if I want to. And I look back and like, nope, it just didn't matter. What mattered was that I was there and present and getting to know them and doing the things that, need, that they needed. It didn't matter whether that my house wasn't perfectly decorated like the houses, clean and decorated like the houses of my friends whose children were, grown, were much older than mine. <laughs> don't compare yourself to other moms and I'm sure you are doing a great job because it's, it's hard so I have these um things to remember so uh tips for you uh there's a spray bottle that they give to you in the hospital um when you have when you first have a baby and it kind of looks like a sport top bottle and you're like what is this for I wish I had like, like one of those arrowhead bottles with a sport top on top. It looks a lot like that. And I felt like it was kind of ridiculous and genius at the same time. It's, and the reason that you need this is because after you have a baby, there's a lot of bleeding that goes on down there in the vaginal area. And when you go to the bathroom, it can kind of sting. And so if you've got this bottle full of water, ready to go, um, you need that in the bathroom. And that's not something that you expect or anybody ever tells you. And they just, the nurses just give it to you in the hospital. Like, what is this for? <laughs> you will totally need it and love it. And uh, just keep it full of water all the time in the bathroom. <laughs> um, when you have a baby, emotions are still crazy. There's all these hormones that you get when you have a baby and they're still there after you have the baby. You can cry over the silliest things like a Pampers commercial where they're so cute or someone takes the last cookie or when your baby grows enough that they just don't need the newborn diapers anymore, that, that might only be a couple of days or a week, maybe two weeks that they need newborn diapers and then they're into size one. <laughs> so if any good intentioned friend gives you a whole package of newborn diapers, <laughs> you probably don't need them. Um, when, when you're, when you're, filling out registries, you size one, size two, size three, you probably won't even go through a whole package of size newborn <laughs> diapers. And these things that, oh, my baby is growing up and it makes you cry. <laughs> Your emotions can go crazy. Um, number three, uh, be prepared to get poop on you. This happens all the time. Uh, more than once, it's really helpful to have an extra t-shirt in your bag. On Facebook today, this, mo this mom was talking about um, going to a doctor's office for something for her baby. And it was super raining, so that, that big rain storm that we had just the other day. And uh, when she went to get her baby out of the car, he, the baby had pooped all over everywhere. So normally she would change her baby in the trunk of her car. I totally did that too, like a whole changing station in the trunk of my car. Uh, but she took all of her stuff into the, into the medical facility and there was no changing station. Um, and so then she had to put her mat down on the floor and change her baby on the floor. She's just gonna write them a little letter about that. But uh, when she was, when she, the baby got poop everywhere and she had to change her clothes for the baby. So then they went in um, and she went to go into the, into the appointment. And then she realized she had poop all over herself. As, as well. Um, and I could totally relate. Um, I used to, in my diaper bag, I would keep a change of clothes for myself for when this happened. One time I was, I was in church and I left to go change the baby. And when we came back, the baby had a whole new outfit and I had a whole new outfit because there was a bit of a poop explosion. <laughs> like I'm like, it was, it was everyone. Everyone was looking at me like, 
you changed your dress? <laughs> like poop up the back, it's everywhere. Um, and you just have to laugh about stuff like this. But if you uh, keep an extra t-shirt or an entire change of clothes in your car, and with the jumper cables and the other emergency supplies that you have, that can be really helpful. And keep a Ziploc bag in your purse um, so that you can <laughs> put poop clothes into the bag and seal it and not have it continue to get everywhere. Um, number four, conversations about the colors of your baby's poop are now totally acceptable. And as your kids get older, you might talk about, so does your poop, is it like, a, is it like soft ice cream? Because that's the best. <laughs> These conversations that you have about children and poop is, I, I, I never thought that that would be a thing. And, and it is. Number five, yoga pants are life or leggings. <laughs> It's so great that yoga pants and leggings are the, it's cool to wear them all the time because uh, your jeans don't fit and you will be tempted to want to continue to wear your maternity jeans um, after you have your baby because they are so comfortable because that bump, uh, it doesn't go away immediately. It's still, there's like a little bit of a squishy blob there um, and they can be comfortable. So go ahead and pull out the stretchies, that's totally normal, totally fine. I was um, at a motor motorcycle repair place and I think I was paying for my husband's motorcycle to be fixed. And uh, and the guy goes, hey, make way for the pregnant lady. I'm like, oh, my baby is two weeks old. I didn't say that, I'm just thinking it. And he called me a pregnant lady, I'm like, I'm not pregnant. I'm just like, thank you. Didn't want to admit that. <laughs> So just be comfortable. Your body changes is, it's a little bit slow to get back to normal. Number six, boobs feel like they've been injected with cement and all of a sudden it might seem quite reasonable to stuff your bra with cabbage leaves. Uh, that letdown and with the nursing, that's, it's, it's, it hurts at first and it feels weird. And I think the cabbage leaves is, um, a recommendation to help reduce the amount. Has anybody ever heard of that before? <laughs> Last time I talked about this, Kimber had said that she had totally, totally heard of that before. And I asked her if it helped, just like, no, it, it didn't help. So it feels weird, it's normal. Waking up, number seven, waking up with leaking circles on your, on your t-shirt is normal for a while. It just seems like there's just like a wet spot right there. My sister-in-law was getting up to give a talk in church. And when she got up there, there were these wet circles on the front of her blouse. And she's, she's just like, whatever, it's nothing I can do about it. I'm on the program. Um, but that letdown that happens uh, after you have a baby, anytime you hear a baby cry, even, even if it's not your baby, that can cause a letdown and, and cause that to happen. So I think it's worth it to invest in good nursing bras and nursing pads and carry an extra t-shirt <laughs> so that you can feel normal and not find yourself in an embarrassing situation, but it's totally normal. Um, this was funny, number eight, you may stress over the umbilical cord. I remember that when I had my babies, I was diligent about wiping it with those alcohol wipes that they give you in the hospital so carefully to make sure that it was clean. Um, and as it started to fall off a little bit, cause there's a little bit of a little piece of the umbilical, umbilical cord that stays attached to the, to the belly button. I'm like, it's almost off. Can I just pull it off? <laughs> I'm like, no, you, you just leave it in it. It will fall off. But, uh, that stress about that, like, what should I do? Cause you're just trying to be the best mom possible. That's normal. Number nine, you quickly realize that your new sleep patterns don't involve a REM cycle so much as a wake up a million times a night to make sure their breathing cycle. Let's talk about that. So have you ever heard of women putting, or parents, putting a mirror over the baby's face to see if it creates a breath pattern just to make sure that they're breathing? Have you ever heard of that? No, um, when babies breathe, it's totally silent. A healthy baby breathing usually is totally silent. And so if you're worried that whether or not your baby is breathing and it wakes you up a million times just to check, 
um, that's actually concerning. Um, it's not concerning for a baby to wake up a million times and need some attention. That is totally normal. But for a mom to wake up a million times to check on the baby, that actually could be a sign of postpartum depression. And you may want to talk to somebody about that because sleep is hard enough already. You don't want to have all of this anxiety and, and have it wake you up extra times to check if your baby is breathing. Um, if your baby is sleeping with their mouth open, um, that's typically not normal. Um, that could be a red flag for a bit of a breathing issue. Um, and tongue tie is pretty common uh, that would cause that. So um, go get that checked out. If your baby is breathing with their mouth open or if you can hear breathing or if your baby is snoring, um, that it's not definitive, but it could be a sign that there's a tongue tie. And so under here, that might need to be clipped or lasered or loosened so that the tongue can move freely and the tongue is supposed to be suctioned up here. Um, so when, when you're in a rest, restful position, the tongue is usually suctioned up underneath the, the, underneath the, uh, the palate there. And if, it, if there's a tongue tie or something, it can affect uh, how the, the mouth develops, where, how the jaw develops. And if the tongue is being pulled back and isn't free and easy, it can cause the jaw to, to develop further back instead of forward, which can restrict breathing and cause um, uh, breathing issues, headaches, uh, back pain, uh, nursing issues, all, all kinds of normal and, and weird things. And so if your baby has got their mouth open or if they're snoring, that's worth looking at. Um, but waking up a million times or every hour when the baby is first born, that's actually normal. Some babies do it, some babies don't. If you get to six months and your baby is still doing that, um, that's not normal. But for the first, for the first few weeks, uh, waking up every one to three hours, that's totally normal. And sometimes if it's every hour, that can be hard to cope with. So, oh yeah, number 10, waking up a million times to feed them. The range of normal is so broad, there is no normal. Well, I like to say the range of normal is like this. <laughs> from one side all the way around to the other side. There is no normal as far as how much a baby sleeps or how much a baby eats. But waiting four hours to feed them, that's really long. But somewhere in the one to three hour range, that's pretty normal. And it could be during the day, it could be during the nighttime. Some babies sleep really long stretches and a lot of babies don't. The babies that sleep really long stretches, those are actually the ones that the doctors are worried about because um, it increases their SIDS risk. If there was something that was going to go wrong in the baby's biological system, if they're easily aroused, if they wake up easily, then their body will usually self-correct and fix it. But if they're getting into a deep sleep, then you want to, then it's, uh, it's, it's a, actually a higher risk. So all of that waking is healthy. The baby is supposed to wake up. You want that to happen. The number 11, not wanting to go outside with your baby because it feels scary to take this newborn outside. That's a normal feeling. And then it changes and you finally go out and you feel so free. That's normal. So all these weird feelings that you have when you have a baby, it's just, it's just hormones. Okay, number 12, baby's poop can explode all the way up their backs. You have to laugh when that happens because when you look back, it is funny. So try to laugh in the moment and pull that extra t-shirt out, out of your bag because you're gonna need it. 13, your baby, your baby might want to nurse for 30 minutes on each breast every time she nurses. So fire up neck, neck, <laughs> Netflix binge watch shows uh, and be guilt-free about it. This is normal. Podcasts, books. But um, of, if you had to choose between a podcast or an audiobook or a Netflix show or a novel, I would say go with the podcast or the audiobook because then your eyes are free to look into your baby's eyes. And then that fosters attachment. So I didn't have I didn't have audiobooks or podcasts. I, I used to read when I would when I would nurse. Um, try not to fall asleep. If you put your baby in a sling, then you don't have to actually hold. Your baby could just kind of in your arms, but your arms are actually holding the baby and they can be up against you and you can nurse like that. It can give you your hand, you give your arms a little bit of a break. Um, but uh, when a baby is first born, it, they may need to eat every two hours. And if it takes 30 minutes to eat, 
then 30 minutes of eating and then probably an hour, an hour free or an hour and a half free. And then it starts all over again, then 30 minutes of eating. So you, you live your life in these small increments. <laughs> That's, it's normal. Uh, when I ask parents how long it takes them to feed their baby, the most common answer is 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but some babies, they eat in five minutes. They just eat really fast. The letdown is really strong and just comes out. And, you know, I hear it hitting the, the throat and going down the stomach. And that's also normal, five minute feeders. But when it takes like 45 minutes to feed a baby, that's actually really long. And maybe the baby's having a hard time with a tongue tie and not getting a good latch. Oh, and something that nobody told me was um, the, the tongue, the, the nipple, when you're, if you're breastfeeding, goes in like that far into their mouth, this far. Like how can they breathe with that all in their mouth? And there's kind of these openings in the, in the sides around the tongue. Okay. okay, number 14, babies grunt a lot and loudly. They make a lot of fun noises and that's adorable. But if they're snoring with their mouth open at nighttime, um, that's, that's not normal. And it gets missed by pediatricians all the time. So bring that up, talk about it, and hopefully you don't get dismissed. Uh, tongue tie often gets missed and dismissed by pediatricians because uh, they haven't got that training in there, but it can cause issues. A cradle cap was weird. I, with number 15, you might be confused or terrified about cradle cap and you want to pick at it. That's normal, but don't pick at it. <laughs> it just makes it worse. Um, number 16, a lot of us don't realize that newborns get pimples. <laughs> Mine didn't, but some, some do. Number 17, you suddenly realize how noisy your neighborhood is when you're desperate for the baby to take a nap in the stroller. A car door slamming can startle them away like, oh, we just got them to sleep. Number 18, newborn life will quickly show you that baby wearing is the best thing ever. This is called co-regulating, co-regulation, and it's made a big difference to sensitive temperamental babies. So there's all kinds of baby wearing devices, slings, baby Bjorn, there's uh, probably a million that I'm, I'm not aware of. And it wasn't until my fifth child that I finally bought a baby wearing thing because um, they were just expensive. And I discovered my child number five, when he was almost too old to wear it, that you could get them for $30 at a secondhand store. <laughs> and it was life-changing to put my baby in a baby carrier. I could have a baby in a carrier right here. And then I could have another one sitting in the shopping cart and another one sitting in the basket of the shopping cart and shop. And I actually figured out how to nurse while walking in a grocery store. So what you do when you have lots of kids. Um, and that was crazy. It only happened a couple of times, but uh, baby carrier, amazing. Number 19, there's a soft spot on the top of their baby's head that might freak you out. You don't want, you don't want to push on it, but the skull will close over the soft spot. That's normal. Number 20, the first time that you do a jumping jack or cough or sneeze after you have a baby, you're like, oh, um, it's because you pee yourself a little bit. Um, and this is not supposed to last forever. Um, you do the Kegel exercises that they tell you to do, but sometimes it, you need more than that. And there's some pelvic floor work that needs to be done in that. Um, and Kegels just aren't enough. Um, I saw this quote on the internet that said, most women wait seven years to fix these issues. So if you're having that kind of an issue, don't wait that long. <laughs> I waited, oh my goodness, I'm almost 49. My oldest is 14 and I have that problem. And I'm gonna go get it fixed in starting in November. <laughs> like, why did I wait so long? Why did I wait so long? Uh, it's because it's one of the things that women don't talk about. They don't talk about. And, but I can't do a sit up without peeing myself a little bit. I can't cough or sneeze or throw up. I have this other problem in my throat that makes me throw up really easily that I'm also gonna go get fixed finally. Um, that was caused from tongue tie <laughs> um, that I also recently got fixed as an adult, tongue tie fixed as an adult, getting myself put back together now that I'm totally done having kids. Um, 
But my doctor would just say, oh, just do Kegels, just do Kegels. And I'm like, the last time I went to go see him to talk about some of this other stuff, I'm like, so I need to go see like pelvic floor specialist or something. He's like, we'll just do Kegels. I'm like, stop telling me to do Kegels. It's not gonna, Kegels are not helping. I need something else. He's like, oh, and he's sending me to a surgeon, uh, a urogynecologist. Um, and he's like, it's pretty inv invasive for them to go check that. I'm like, I don't care. I wanna be able to do a sit up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of, of having this problem. If I have a coughing fit in a restaurant uh, and you're, you know, that's going to make you pee yourself. That's the worst. It's, it's terrible, but women don't talk about that. And so I think with Facebook and podcasts, women are try, talking about that stuff more and like, Oh, that's not normal. I can, like, there's a way to fix that. There's physiotherapy. There's a surgery. I had a friend, she's like, no, there's a little surgery that they could fix that. I'm like, Oh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> so I want to tell everyone, uh, it's super embarrassing, but women don't, you don't have to just put up with it. These things that happen after having kids doesn't happen to everyone, but it happens to some of us, especially after five kids. Um, it's fixable. Number 21, if you're breastfeeding, you may feel like you're living your life in two to three hour increments. Yeah, that's totally how I felt with my first, especially, except it was uh, 90 minutes. Increment, 90 minute increments. Number 22, the fourth trimester will show you how amazing this newborn bubble is. Just enjoy all those moments. If someone comes over to off and offers to help, um, especially if you're super tired, um, let them do the dishes. <laughs> let them bring you dinner uh, and enjoy your own baby. <laughs> Sometimes they, all, they always want to hold the baby, but um, let them do all those things that you just don't have time to do so that you can enjoy your own baby. Okay, so truth number two. Let's talk about postpartum depression. Loving and frustrating thoughts, focusing on the frustrating thoughts, stem from a desire to be a great mom. And so a mom might be super frustrated that She's frustrated. She's frustrated that she's frustrated. And it's uh, a this cycle. Um, having a baby can be happy. Uh, it's a very important event in your life, um, but it can also be super hard and super stressful. And so there's the baby blues and then there's postpartum depression. So the baby blues happens to about 50% of moms, so half. And it's just sudden mood swings and it can last from a few hours to a couple of weeks. And then if it doesn't go away, the mood swings can get worse and you can feel sad and mad and angry and super irritable. Um, and it could become postpartum depression. And this happens to uh, 10 to 20% of women. Um, and it's just intense feelings of sadness, despair, anxiety, irritability. They used to say that there's postpartum depression, there's postpartum anxiety, there's postpartum other things, and there's some, some new acronyms that they have for that. But it's, it's a hormonal disorder. It can actually happen anytime in the first year. So you might get through six months with your new baby, and then suddenly you start to feel sad or irritable or really unmotivated. You just don't wanna go anywhere. And uh, usually when this happens to a woman, her husband notices. She may not realize some, this is happening to her. She's just like sad all the time. And, and the husband like, honey, I think we should go talk to a doctor. And like, no, I'm fine, but I don't feel like going anywhere. And, and it just can be frustrating. And, but it's, it's not a choice. The postpartum depression doesn't come because of any choices or behaviors that a woman has done. Uh, it's just a hormonal imbalance that can just happen. Uh, it's not your fault if that happens to you. You could be predisposed to postpartum depression if depression generally runs in your family or if you've had episodes of depression, also not your fault before you have kids that can increase your chances of having postpartum depression. Um, and men can get postpartum depression as well, um, which I thought was funny, but all of the stress of having a new baby can cause a hormonal change, even in men, and they can have it, but it's a much lower percentage. So some of the things that a woman might think are on this image that I got from 
Amy Fields at Arizona Breastfed Baby. She posted this on her Instagram and she said, I could share it with you. Where a woman might, might be thinking, I can't stop thinking how hard the birth was. I'm just obsessing about it. I don't feel like myself. I don't recognize my body. I think I still don't recognize my body. Um, I thought I would feel bonded with my baby right away, but I don't. No one ever asks how I'm doing. Uh, I have never been this tired. I had no idea that breastfeeding would be this hard. All these thoughts about how hard it is and a woman can really start to put, her, to put herself down and she wants to be a good mom, but she just feels like she's not good enough. And, and it can take therapy. Um, you just go see a doctor to, to help with that. It can be really hard to pull them, pull themselves out of it. So restlessness, anger, irritability, sadness, crying all the time, worthlessness and guilt are big ones that I see a lot. Um, fear of hurting your baby or yourself. And then you might have things like trouble or troubling or scary thoughts. Like what would happen if I just drive off this bridge and just put an end to everything? That's a pretty scary thought. Or how about I just leave my baby here and I just walk away and some stranger will pick up my baby and take care of my baby because I just can't do it anymore. But these are extreme things that can, that are real, that can happen to a woman that has postpartum depression. Uh, a woman might be overly worried about her baby or just want to ignore the baby and not be concerned at all. Little or no energy, headaches, chest pains, rapid heartbeat, like, a, like anxiety, like a feeling me having an anxiety attack with the fast and shallow breathing. They might have trouble sleeping well, poor eating habits, trouble focusing and remembering or making decisions, just laying on the couch and not wanting to make any decisions. They can never decide what to make for dinner, so they don't. Never decide if they want to go out, so they don't. A uh, little interest in things that they used to enjoy, um, especially sex. Those are all postpartum depression things. I have, when I do, when I do sleep consultations, I have this extensive, history form that I give to women. And some of the questions I ask are, do you, can you sleep when your baby is sleeping? Um, and if you can't, it's a red flag for postpartum depression. Are you having any troubling or scary thoughts? Um, how is your eating? A healthy woman will say, I eat so much. And postpartum depression, like, well, I just don't feel like eating hardly ever. Um, those are some red flags just so I can kind of know if there's some of that some of that going on. Um, there is no single cause for postpartum depression, physical, emotionally, emotional, and lifestyle factors. They may play a role, but depression runs in families. It's just, it's not a choice that you make. You haven't done something wrong if you're struggling with this. But lack of sleep can exacerbate the symptoms of postpartum depression, make it, make it more intense. And Sleep depression can also, uh, sorry, sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation can mimic the signs of postpartum depression. So every woman that I work with in a consultation basis is usually sleep deprived. So I'd like to know, are you just sleep deprived or is there some postpartum depression in there as well? And I can't help with the postpartum depression, but if I know that it's there, then I know to be extra sensitive. And if the mom is super frustrated and says something really mean to me, it's not personal, it's probably postpartum depression. She's not, it's not sleeping well. And then you know that it's not postpartum depression when as soon as we can get the baby sleeping well, then the mom can sleep well, and then she just feels energetic and happy and, and all better really fast. It's not postpartum depression at all. It's just sleep deprivation. And so sometimes it's hard to figure that out right from, right from the get-go. 10%, 10% of fathers become just depressed before or just after the baby is born. So Chris, you'll watch Monique and Monique will watch Chris. And then and uh, you'll listen to each other and, and help each other. When you get postpartum depression, your perceptions are totally skewed. And so if you're doing a sleep plan, parent, couples that are doing a sleep plan with me, um, and I know that the mom has sleep deprivation. I encourage her to listen to her husband a lot because as things progress, she may not see the progress at all. But, and he will think, what are you talking about? This is like getting better and better and better every day. All these things are totally working. We're getting longer stretches. 
the baby is much less tired. He's happier during the day. I can totally see it. This is, this is working. And then I'm like, I don't see it. My baby is terrible sleeper. I don't see it. I'm the worst mom. And so just that, that's just perceptions being skewed. So hopefully there's the trust is there to start because you trust each other. If one of you has that challenge. All right. Truth number three, all babies are truly unique. <laughs> they are, it's a, they'll have their own set of cells, but it's temperament that plays a huge factor. All of those cells that they get temperament. Um, what a baby's tired signs are different from baby to baby. Are they consistent? Are they can do, does this baby need lots of consistency? Are they flexible? What works at bedtime can be different from baby to baby. This road is just not straight. Some babies are easy while other babies take some work to figure out or a lot of work to figure out. They're like a puzzle. So don't compare your baby to your friend's baby <laughs> and think that what's wrong with your baby? And so I, I added this chart here as a, I love this chart. It's from the Child Sleep Institute. And there are all these temperament traits that you wanna look at when you're trying to figure out this puzzle. And so there's some like temperament scoring websites that you can answer all these questions to help you figure this out. But this one's just really uh, simplified. So temperament traits, there's the activity level of your baby. Is it they have low activity, moderate activity, high activity? how distractible they are, how intense they are, how regular are they? Are they predictable with eating, sleeping? Are they sensitive, sensitive to light, sensitive to sound? Are they perceptive about other things going on around them? Are they approachable or is it hard for them to warm up to new people? Are they adaptable? Are they persistent? They just know what they want and they hold out until they get it. I think there's nine total. There's one more here that didn't fit, <laughs> didn't fit my image. Um, but you see, there's some more to the left and then there's some more to the right. And so if you did something like this to score your child and you have a lot of things on the right and less than on the left, then that's like you have an alert baby. <laughs> and that really affects how well they fall asleep. Um, especially is what I'm, because I'm a sleep coach, I'm looking at the sleep aspects. And so a baby that is super distractible, that's like the distractibility, that second one, if they're really distractible, they may have a hard time eating because every sound makes them go, what, what? <laughs> and, and then it's harder for them to eat. And so if they have a hard time eating, then they may have a hard time sleeping because they just didn't get enough to eat during the day because they're just so distracted every time they ate. And so there's tricks to help with that. A baby that uh, is really persistent might not want to go to sleep and will just hold out <laughs> and cry and fuss and refuse because they don't want to miss anything. It's like this, they have this fear of missing out as a baby. <laughs> um, and some babies are really sensitive to light. You have to chop off the lights and block everything out. So there's all these temperament traits that affect uh, the, the uniqueness of a baby. And you have to figure it out so that you know how to parent. Uh, your particular child. I specialize in alert kids, which are usually more on this side than this side. And there's a lot of tricks to help these children learn how to learn sleep skills. Um, and if you don't, then you'll be extra tired and they'll be extra tired. And you think, when, when is my child going to sleep? <laughs> and think, oh, they'll sleep eventually. Um, and, the, but it might be a really long time, years until they actually figure out sleep and you don't, you don't have to wait years. So babies are supposed to wake up at night. Um, for the first four months, waking every one to four hours is normal. And especially the first few weeks, waking every hour is normal. And then it gets longer and longer and longer. Um, and the reason that they wake up, there's, there's lots of reasons, but one of them wake up to eat, <laughs> wake up to poop, wake up because they get because they get hot um, or they just need to connect they need to make some eye contact with their parents and that helps them to feel safe and, and secure so that's that's an important part of the development uh, waking is a part of their natural sleep cycle this uh this really long paragraph is from a sciency 
<laughs> assigned to play. So babies wake up during the night primarily because their brain waves shift and change cycles as they move from REM sleep to other stages of non-REM sleep. And the different wave patterns our brains make during certain periods define these sleep cycles or stages of sleep. As babies move from one stage of sleep to another during the night, they transition. In that transition, many babies will wake up. I call it a partial arousal. Sometimes they call or cry out. Sometimes they wake up and they're hungry. This is normal for babies and adults. It's normal for adults too, to wake up multiple times. So I think of like a sleep cycle. It's, it's kind of like a wave up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, just to keep it really simple. But really it goes up and every time it hits up here, it's like a partial arousal. So maybe it wakes up and they wake up 45 minutes into the night and they wake up and then it comes down and they wake up and it's down. And then now they're getting into deep sleep. It's down here and then they come up here and down here. And there's a lot more up here. There's a lot more down here. There's a lot more up here. Um, and it just cycles. So every time it hits up here, they wake up and they might need something. And then as adults, as you learn to become get good sleep, you don't remember waking up. You wake up and you just roll over and you go right back to sleep. And so that's it's normal. Babies um, wake up due to lack of hormones. Uh, they don't even have melatonin. You've heard of melatonin, a sleepy hormone. They don't even have that <laughs> until three months. But in the evening, if you're breastfeeding, breast milk has melatonin in it. So that, that can be helpful. Um, babies can wake up because of developmental milestones. So every time a baby goes through a developmental milestone, um, have you ever heard of this book? It's all about the developmental milestones, the Wonder Week. So there's a Wonder Week app. There's the website. There's this book. I actually took a, a course from a Wonder Weeks course that was really intense. Um, and they talk all about the different developmental milestones that a baby goes through. And some of them, the brain is actually jumping in size. There's so much going on. And so the brain's focus is focusing on some emerging skills rather than sleep. And so the baby doesn't self-regulate very well during these two week periods or four week periods or eight week periods, depending on which milestone it is. And and the baby will be more cranky and clingy and frustrated and will need a lot more holding and a lot more attention. And then when the emerging, the emerging skill comes out, then sleep falls back into place. They become back to their sweet self. It's like, what happened to my baby? So right around four months, by the time they had four months old, there's been four, four major developmental milestones. And the fourth one, a lot of people call it the four month sleep regression. Have you heard of that? <laughs> so the four month sleep regression, but really that's a terrible name for it, <laughs> but sleep falls apart. So they call it a regression, but there is so much good things, great things happening in the baby's brain that it's really a progression. It's a four month sleep progression, <laughs> but uh, sleep is not the focus. Self-settling is not the focus and the parents are needed with a lot more co-regulation to help them through it. And then the emergence, the emerging skill happens. And then after the fourth one, the baby is at an age where they are ready to learn sleep skills and develop better self-soothing. And the self-soothing skill is like a six year process. <laughs> and for around four months, it's just beginning. And so there's no pressure well, not from me anyway, to do any sort of sleep training at, at four months. 18 weeks is like the earliest that I would ever help a mom or help a parent uh, work on sleep because before that, there's so much going on. It's more about figuring out what the baby can do rather than teaching them sleep skills. So if you're looking at like uh, any sort of sleep training program, our sleep programs, if they're getting you, asking you to do cry it out to, to, to teach sleep skills under four months, um, it can cause a lot of stress that can look like an anxiety disorder. Not that it is, but the baby might stop, might stop smiling or the, the personality um, may change um, in, a, in a negative way. And that it was just, it was just too stressful. So anything that you do before four months, the focus is figuring out what your 
baby can do, not teaching them a skill. And so if you lay your baby on the mattress, drowsy, wet awake, and a little pat, pat, shush, shush, you just figure out that they can do it. And if your baby cries their head off for five minutes, it's not working. Stop, pick them up. You're, that baby may not be able to learn, do uh, not be very good at self-soothing and they need to be held to sleep. They need to be rocked to sleep. They need to be fed or nursed to sleep. So maybe you just need that. And it's normal and healthy. Um, you can't pick up your baby too much. That's not a thing. <laughs> so if a baby is acting like they need to be held a lot, then there's probably temperament traits that are making it difficult for them to regulate with all the stuff going on around them. That baby might be extra perceptive and notice more details than your friend's baby that is the same age. And your baby is not as easily to be soothed as that other baby. And they need a lot more holding. So follow your intuition about, about things like that. If you feel like your baby needs to be picked up and you want to pick up your baby, pick up your baby. Don't listen to all those outside voices saying, you're just gonna spoil your baby. You're gonna be holding your baby till they're 18. Um, that's not true. Uh, a child that is asking for a lot of attention and to be picked up a lot, usually has a, has a need. Uh, and if you didn't pick them up and help them as much as they're asking, their potential plummets. So let's say that there's a baby that is fairly easy um, this is their potential. And then you have a baby that needs a lot of holding, that cries a lot, is cranky a lot, just needs to be right next to their, their, care, their parent a lot. And you give them all that attention, their potential is actually up here. They actually have a higher potential than just the normal regular baby. But if you take that baby that cries a lot and needs lots of attention and you don't hold them a lot, their potential is down here and actually it kind of plummets to the floor. So Babies that need are asking for a, a lot of extra attention. Um, if you don't give it to them, then their potential goes down. If you do give it to them, it might make them their potential so high that they become like the leaders of our society. And it could be because their temperament traits are such that they're more perceptive. And so they're just overloaded with information. And when you hold them, that extra that they're asking for and co-regulation, co-regulate with them, your, your problem solving with them together, dealing with all of that extra information, their brain is having a hard time processing. And so as that child, that super alert child grows up, they will continue to be perceptive, but will have had all of this practice managing all of that information. And, and then that, that's what makes their potential way up, way up here. They did a study up in Canada about that. Um, babies who don't wake up are at a much higher risk for SIDS. So avoid things that bring babies to a deeper sleep. Okay, so swaddling. If you swaddle a baby too tightly because they sleep better, um, that might help them to sleep so good that they don't wake up if something goes wrong in their body. And so you don't want the swaddle to be so tight that they can't break out of it. And you don't want the swaddle to be so tight that it causes a hip displacement. So be careful with, with swaddling. Um, white noise machines. Uh, a white noise machine can be great for helping a baby sleep better, but there are different, there are different frequencies of white noise machines. And so there are these great ones, these great sounds called pink noise or brown noise, and they really do help the brain get into deeper sleep for longer. And you should not use them with newborn babies because <laughs> these babies are supposed to wake up. And so wait until, wait until after six months to try something other than white noise. Um, I have this app. It's called White Noise. It's hot pink. Uh, white Noise Light, I think, is the free version. Um, and it has a setting inside called pink noise and a setting called brown noise. And the brown noise is a deeper pitch than the white noise. Um, and when my husband starts snoring, I can turn on this sound and my brain will block it out along with the snoring and I can go back to, I can go back to sleep. It's amazing. We were in Italy 
and staying at an Airbnb. And every night at 10 o'clock, the neighbor right on the other side of the wall where our bed was uh, would turn on the TV really loud. <laughs> like, oh no, this is terrible. I'm like, oh, I have my brown noise, my white noise app with a brown noise setting and I turn it on really loud and we could sleep right through it. So the, the white noise, the brown noise, the pink noise, they really do help. So don't use the deeper sounds until the baby's over six months because you want the baby to wake up at night. That is normal, it is healthy. When the babies don't wake up at night, that's more worrisome as far as SIDS goes. Sleeping on the tummy. If the baby sleeps longer and deeper when you put them on their tummy, you may think you're getting a break and you're doing them a favor, but they arouse less easily on their stomach. So that's why they say, put your baby on their back because you want them to be easily arousable in those first, in that first fourth trimester, in that first at the beginning, at the beginning when the SIDS risk is so much higher between two and four months. And so sleep your baby on your back. Don't use anything in a deeper pitch than white noise. If you're going to swaddle, don't swaddle too tightly. And all these tricks that keep your baby asleep, you actually don't want to use them, except that babies are supposed to wake for that fourth trimester. And then after 18 weeks, there are things that we can start to work on to try to get longer stretches. And uh, five months, a five hour stretch um, is, is pretty good. Eight hours by eight months is pretty common. To a lot of eight month olds can do 12 hours overnight. When the baby is first new like that, those wake ups, they're supposed to happen. Okay, truth number five. Hold on until five months and things might get easier. Get through that four month sleep progression. I think if I say it enough that it'll catch on. Four month sleep progression. Um, so if you get to five months, you know, through the four month sleep progression and then things might get easier. A lot of people tell me that their baby was doing these five hour stretches at three months old. And then at five months old, they're only doing two hour stretches. What happened? Like, well, everything that happens before 18 weeks is kind of like, that's one brain. And everything after 18 weeks is another brain because there's a huge brain change. There's actually four huge brain changes, but the fourth one, uh, that's huge. And so don't compare your five month old baby to your three month old baby. Maybe three months was great and five months is terrible. But for some people, three months was terrible and five months is great. <laughs> and so after 18 weeks, you start to see what sleep is possible and whatever happened before then, it just doesn't matter. So you cope for the first 18 weeks and then you start to see what your baby can do. And then you might need to take steps to help the sleep come along or it might just, it might just fall into place naturally. So up until that point, do whatever it takes for you and the baby to get good sleep. Baby wearing, long walks, naps, motion, um, all of those things. Uh, motion sleep is better than no sleep. And actually the latest research that has come out says motion sleep is just as good as still sleep. So when they say the sleep on a mattress is better than the sleep in a baby carrier or the sleep in a stroller or the sleep in a car seat, uh, that motion sleep, it's just not true. It's just as good. So this number, five and a half hours of sleep in a 24 hour period helps you stay closer to sane. So when you're waking up a lot, add up how much sleep that you're getting. And if it's less than five and a half hours, um, don't go anywhere because your perceptions from that sleep deprivation could be so skewed that you leave your baby in the car. You drive through your garage door without opening it. You run red lights, um, things like that. It's really, it can be really dangerous. And so accept all, if that's you, accept all offers of help, do whatever it takes to make sure that in a 24 hour period, you're getting at least five and a half hours of sleep. Because if you're getting less than that, if you're having a sleep emergency. It's, it's just not safe for you or your baby. You can start a bedtime routine by three months. That's great. Sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes it isn't. Um, but by the time a baby is four and a half months old, they really do start to recognize the sequence of events. 
And if you've had a, got a routine in place, their body knows that when you do white noise, sleep sack, song, kisses, put them in bed, they recognize that that series of events leads to sleep and their body after three months will, will start to produce extra melatonin around, around that time. Uh, take advantage of feeding sessions to make eye contact and connect uh, with the natural rhythm. Um, pretend all of those cute cooing and baby sounds are real sentences and respond accordingly. So when your baby makes sounds at you, pretend they said something that made sense. Like, mommy, I love your hair today. Pretend that's what they said. Oh, you like my hair today? I think your cute little bald head is adorable too. And then baby says, so I'm like, uh, uh. Oh, you like my, my blouse? Thank you. I think your little dress is so cute too. <laughs> oh, are you hungry? Come on over here. I'll snuggle you and I'm going to feed you. So you start to develop this cadence of conversation with your baby. They say something, you say something back. And they say something and you say something back. And it helps vocabulary to develop right from the get-go. And so then they learn to talk and communicate with you sooner in a really natural way. Don't resist speaking to your baby in that silly high-pitched voice. So you know when you want to say to a baby, oh, your baby is so cute, and you get this high-pitched voice. Oh, you're so cute. When you grow up, you're just going to be my princess. I'm going to love you forever. Or peekaboo, peekaboo. Oh, there she is. And you get this high-pitched voice, and then you see someone looking at you, and you're doing this high-pitched voice, and you feel silly. Like, Oh, I mean, I mean. I mean, peekaboo, oh, peekaboo, and <laughs> you try not to do it. But that high-pitched voice that we, you just naturally, you want to talk to a baby like that. The high-pitched voice um, stimulates brain development. So why would we stop doing that? Be silly, talk in the high-pitched voice. It it's good for your baby to have that happen. So don't try to be cool. Talk like this to your baby, because it helps with brain development. All right, so are you ready for the lie? Let's see. Here's the lie. Babies will figure out sleep by six months, so just wait. And if they don't, just wait a little longer. And if they don't, just wait a little bit longer. And just keep using that coping strategy, that crutch, just wait longer. Oh, just wait a little bit longer and longer and longer. And then your baby is three years old. <laughs> and you're still feeding them to sleep or rocking them to sleep. And they're getting really heavy and your back is really tired. You're like, when is this going to happen? You don't have to wait that long. If you can get past five months or at least 18 weeks, you can, you can take steps. But some babies, they don't figure it out and they need help, especially if they have an alert temperament. They're more on this side of that temperament trait chart. So here are some things that can keep babies from sleeping. And so each one of these arrows is five things. And I have uh, on my YouTube channel, I have a few videos that talk about in depth, these five things that keep babies from sleeping. So I, I, some of them are called five sleep secrets or five things that keep babies from sleeping or things like that. And they're on my YouTube channel. So go find them because I make recordings like this when I talk to parent groups and then I go post them because it's helpful. So the first one, hunger. Babies may not be sleeping because they're hungry. So feed the baby if you think that they're hungry in the middle of the night. The middle of the night is not the time to make a decision about stopping feedings. Oh, I'm not going to feed you this time because I'm so tired. Um, you're not going to make a good decision in the middle of the night. So just feed your baby and then plan to have a conversation with somebody else about that during the day, in the morning. Talk to a lactation consultant, talk to your doctor, talk to your spouse, your partner, uh, your good friend, your sleep consultant like me to figure out if that baby, does my baby need to eat in the middle of the night? What's normal? Because the range of normals is kind of broad. And the older they get, the easier it is to figure out. But if your three-month-old is waking up a lot in the middle of the night, um, they probably need it. But if the baby's waking up like every hour, 
it's probably not a sleep issue, it's actually a feeding issue. Talk to a lactation consultant about, is the latch not good enough? Maybe they're not just not taking in enough milk each time and so that they are hungry every hour. Um, but uh, a 12 month old, does a 12 month old need to eat in the middle of the night? Maybe, probably not, but some do. Does an eight month old need to eat four times in the middle of the night? Probably not. Does a three-year-old need to eat in the middle of the night? No. <laughs> and so, you know, every scenario is different. Every baby is unique, but you don't make that decision in the middle of the night. Okay, another one, missed tired signs. Your baby has a period of time that it can be awake. It's called the wakeful window. And at the end of the wakeful window, I call it the sleep window. Lots of people call it the sleep window. And if you're not helping your baby fall asleep in the sleep window, then their body floods with cortisol. And then it's really hard to fall asleep. And they might have this period of fussiness for about 45 minutes. It's like a 45 minute burn off of this cortisol. It's a stress hormone. And, uh, and if you get extra cortisol in the system from missing tired signs, the naps can be hard to regulate and the middle of the night can be harder because of missed tired signs. So that's something when I talk with parents and we're working on a sleep plan, we're looking really closely at day sleep and reading body language. And hopefully in your fourth trimester, you have figured out what your baby's tired signs are. Do they uh, zone out and stare off into space? Do they get red? up here? Do they get dark circles under here? Does their blinking change to get faster or slower? Does your baby rub their head on your shoulder? And there's all, there's a whole bunch more for toddlers, but it can be subtle. If you have an alert baby, those tired signs, they might only happen for a moment and they're subtle and they can be hard to miss. So it can, that can be a challenge. Okay. Another one that can keep babies from sleeping is insufficient day sleep. If the expectation for how often the baby should nap is, is, is missed and the baby only sleeps a couple 30 minute naps a day um, instead of three or four hours a day, <laughs> then that baby's gonna have extra cortisol in their system. And then it's really hard to fall asleep and stay asleep because they are so overtired and there's just so much extra cortisol in their system. So, in, so day sleep helps night sleep. I actually have a bit of a vision about that. When you're working on sleep, <laughs> I have these Legos I found in, in a drawer. I'm like, oh, I still have Duplo. I don't have any little kids um, anymore. So day sleep. This is the foundation for everything else. You get the day sleep any way possible. Don't worry about how you get it. You're focusing on body language and how much. Make sure that your baby seems rested during the day. And then that helps to support nights. And then you work on night sleep. And then when night sleep is good and you've got some bedtime independence, the child can fall asleep by themselves, then you might work on how they nap. So if you have to rock, hold, feed to sleep for the naps, go ahead. That's totally fine. And then you would work on the nights if your baby is over five months old or at least 18 weeks. Waiting until after six months is awesome. So then you work on night sleep and night sleep independence. And then you would work on naps. So go ahead and nurse and hold and hold and rock the naps work on nap night independence and then work on nap independence so you would do it in that order hopefully hopefully you can see that so is it backwards for you guys or is it forwards okay good because <laughs> when i look at it it's backwards oh the sign behind me to me it looks backwards i hope for you it looks forwards somebody gave this uh a mom's group gave me this sign, super cute, um, when I gave a presentation like this to their mom's group. All right, so another thing that can keep babies from sleeping is having a too late bedtime. So if you're putting your baby to bed at 10 o'clock, that's totally appropriate if they're a newborn or if they're just a few weeks old, but by the time they're three months old, they start to develop a 12 hours a day with naps and a 12 hour night with wake-ups. Um, and so if a baby is six months old and you're still putting them to bed at 10 o'clock, you definitely have a too late bedtime, unless you live somewhere like in Saudi Arabia, where 10, 11 is the bedtime and 10, 11 is also the wake up time because everybody stays up until two or three o'clock in the morning to avoid the heat 
of the day. So yeah, this is cultural differences are fine, but typically here in the United States, um, babies are going to bed sometime between six and eight and waking up sometime between six and eight. Um, and so a too late bedtime, it's all about cortisol. By having that too late bedtime, they've missed multiple natural sleep windows. And they have all this extra cortisol in the system, making it really hard to sleep and stay asleep. And then this last one, discomfort from medical issues. If you have tongue tie, it's a medical thing that can be fixed or other breathing issues from sleep apnea, or maybe they are super sensitive um, and they have some sensory processing issues or allergies or eczema or food sensitivities, or maybe there's some extra anxiety from uh, an imperfect uh, home life balance. Maybe when the, the husband and the wife are no longer together and there's a lot of discord there that can, that kind of stress can, can cause issues uh, with sleep. So th these are all the things that you would want to look at first. And then after that, then you can think about fixing uh, independence for night nighttime independence. So you look at hunger first and day sleep and timing of bedtimes and any potential medical issues. I have to say tongue tie is a medical issue that uh, I come across the most. <laughs> um, probably because that is one of the things that come along with tongue tie is frequent waking. And everyone I talk to has frequent waking. And so that I can ask the easy questions. Does your baby snore? <laughs> Do they sleep with their mouth open? <laughs> uh, Do they have a good latch? And, and just some simple questions can help me to know if they need to go see a, a tongue tie professional to get that evaluated and then remove that variable. And then we can just work on the behavioral component. So there's my five truths and a lie. If anybody wants to ask any questions, now is a really good time. Okay, so Monique, you have your camera on and Holly, you have your camera on. So I'm gonna pick on you. Was there anything that I just talked about that was surprising? So Monique and Chris, unmute yourself and tell me, was, were you surprised by anything? We were a little surprised about the postpartum depression for dads. We hadn't heard of that yet. Yeah, I don't think men talk about that. No. What what man would admit that? <laughs> okay. What about you, Holly? What was surprising for you? Um, I was surprised when you mentioned about the like longer stretches at night being a higher sed for us. Like we're getting five or six hour stretches, and I'm like, is there something that we're doing that's not okay? Um, How, and your your baby is seven weeks. I don't I don't think we're doing it. I think she's just sleeping. I don't know. We're not like doing anything like. Well, she's not on her tummy, right? No. And you're not swaddling so super tightly? No, we can get a hand in there and she can get her arms out, which she almost does. Perfect. Always. That sounds perfect. And you're not using anything deeper pitch than a regular white noise? No, just regular yeah. white noise. Doesn't sound like you're doing anything wrong at all. Full TV static. Yeah, good. If your baby was sleeping eight or 12 hours, that might be more worrisome, but five hours, uh, normal, healthy. That sounds good. That's good. We like it. <laughs> five hours because you're getting at least five and a half hours because you got a five and a five hour stretch there, and then all the other little stretches between feedings. Yeah. So I mean, no, no, like hoping that we're gonna get it every time. We just it's like okay, the baby eight, we're gonna just all go to bed. If you move eight thirty, we're just doing we're doing it. So then I wish for you that that lasts until the four month sleep progression, and that after the four month sleep. Oh, I have to say it right. The progression, the four month sleep progression that it comes back. Or maybe you want that super amazing, super go-getter alert child and it'll all fall apart and you'll help them with some sleep and then they'll become president of the United States. <laughs> that would be okay too, right? Yeah, we'll see. Totally, if I do sleep training, it's totally worth it if they become president or something else amazing. Well, I hope you will all join my Facebook group, Sleep Sisters Get Quiet Nights. Tag me in there if you have a quick question. Um, if you are getting desperate, check out my blog on my website, getquietnights.com. Uh, watch the 
five things that keep your babies from sleeping or five sleep secrets on my YouTube channel. And if your baby is over 18 weeks and you've exhausted all of my other resources and you need a consultation, we'll start with a free sleep assessment. And then you kind of, I'll talk about my methods, no, no surprises. And then I would, and then we could work together and I can help you. But good luck to all of you. Sorry. Yeah, young babies with heart disease. Ja Jamie, you have a question? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, that's all right. Um, can babies like, um, I don't know how to word this right. Like if you're having your baby like sleep on your chest and they're like laying like kind of on their stomach on your chest, you know, um, can they learn like bad sleep habits like that where they don't sleep well on their back at night? Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. So you're worried about uh, developing bad habits yeah, by, like by using a crutch by letting your baby sleep on, on your chest. Yeah, like for naps or like when you're wearing them, like does that make them not sleep well on their back then when they're no. sleeping at night? It, okay. It doesn't. So usually um, parents that are letting their child sleep on their chest or baby wear, usually those parents have tried letting them sleep on a mattress by themselves and it just didn't work. <laughs> and so the baby wearing or the sleeping on the chest is the coping strategy and that's what that baby needs. And so it's totally fine. You're meeting your child's needs. And then when your baby is older and able to make a change, like after 18 weeks, when uh, the, the brain is at a point where they're able to actually learn and work on skills and change some of those brain pathways for sleep, that would be a good time to work on it. Or even later than that, if you don't want to do it until six months, you don't want to do it until eight months, very changeable. So babies that sleep on, on chess, that's usually not the parent's first choice. They're not doing that on purpose. It's a coping strategy that is very appropriate. The baby has let you know that you need that they need that and you're doing it. So that's good. No, it's not a bad habit. Okay, cool. Thank you. Carmen, Nicole, do you have any questions? There you are. Hi. <laughs> We were also in the process of making dinner, dinner, dinner so. and <laughs> evening stuff, showers and yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on like the snoo or bass nets, like some of the more trendy things that the snoo is like all in one? Snoo is super expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to rent one. Don't worry. <laughs> if we, you know, if it's even something worth getting or safe. Yeah. I, I don't personally think that it's worth getting. Um, the thing about the snoo that I don't like because the motion part totally fine with but the thing about the snoo is that you're don't you like strap your baby or kind of velcro your baby down yeah yeah the snoo, the so, so then it would prevent the any natural movement that the baby does and the and the efforts to be safe I mean that's appropriate because you want to keep it safe because it's moving around so much um but then they, the baby's not free to to move around to move around as much and so usually when uh babies are in a in a snoo and the parents want to work on sleep skills we have to undo the snoo dependence yeah got it okay that's interesting that but sense. when you're desperate and nothing is working and that works <laughs> i get it <laughs> right got it thank you thank i think you. The, i think the snoo was probably better than putting your baby in a in a swing overnight or in a car seat <laughs> and then rocking it with your foot <laughs> overnight. Um, so safe, you want, you want what you're using to be safe. And, but you also want your baby to be free to develop the movement. And so around three months when their baby is breaking out of the swaddle, it's really important to stop swaddling and switch to a sleep sack instead. Um, another thing I'm concerned about with the snoo is that it's replacing a parent, which I think is the whole idea is that it's replacing a parent. But if a baby is needing extra attention, it really is to get so much, the baby gets so much more when it's the parent giving them that extra holding and extra comfort and the parent is more aware of, of the needs, but it definitely takes a lot more effort. I personally think that it's worth it. Yeah. But when you're desperate and sleep deprived, the snoo could be super handy. Got it. Okay. Perfect. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? All right. 
well, join my Facebook group and uh, keep me keep my information handy in case you need me later. And uh, check out my check check out my uh, YouTube channel for other things like this as you need it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye, everybody.